So today we have Chris Yu visiting from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, well, visiting virtually, He'll be telling us about some of his work on one dimensional curves, 3D. So please take it away. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just to make sure, is, is the slides on screen? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so thanks. Yeah, I'm Chris, and I'm here to talk about some uh, recent work that we've done on repulsive curves. So um, we might, you probably all know what curves are supposed to be, but what does it mean for the curves to be repulsive? Well, it's not that they're unpleasant to be around or that they smell really bad, actually. Um, the curves just really want to stay away from each other. So I'll get into that shortly. Um, there we go. There, so there are four main questions that we're going to be answering throughout this talk, and we're going to focus on one at a time. Um, and so let's start with just asking, what is collision avoidance? Um, so the answer to that, maybe we should start at the very beginning um, and just define what a space curve is. So a space curve is just a one-dimensional curve that sits in 3D space. You know, it only has length, no area or volume. I'm sure people are um, familiar with at least the notion of that. Um, so in graphics, a lot of things can be modeled using space curves. Um, these kind of incur include obvious curve-like objects like you know, ropes, threads, or textiles, um, as well as patterns that are made of many curves. You know, characters can also be rigged using curves. Um, and curves are also useful for just like engineering applications like this retractable telescoping structure. Um, in general, a lot of things that primarily exist along the length direction can be modeled using curves. Um, and so we do end up working with curves pretty often, just in general. And often when we're working with curves, we want to manipulate them somehow without having them collide, pass through each other. Um, you know, collisions are usually non-physical. Um, you know, they cannot be physically realized. In the real world, things cannot phase through each other. Um, so if you have a collision in your simulation, for instance, that's usually undesirable if you're trying to model some kind of uh, real world scenario. You know, you can't untangle your earbuds just by pulling them through, uh, as nice as that would be. Um, beyond just collisions, we'd also like to avoid near collisions, since these are basically just a small error away from actually becoming collision. Um, and, you know, we introduce small errors all the time during simulations and other um, modeling type uh, tasks. And so we really want to add some kind of robustness to our situation, whatever it is that we're modeling. Um, robustness from uh, you know, actual collisions occurring. So we're gonna refer to this problem as collision avoidance because we are trying to avoid collisions. And so collision avoidance, even though it sounds similar to collision detection, it's not the same. Um, in graphics, we have a lot of methods that we know of for collision detection, and these are widely used in practice for like physics engines, games, for instance. Um, avoidance is a bit of a different story. Um, so the way I draw the distinction is that collision detection is really a simulation problem. We're not really trying to control the outcome of the simulation. We're just saying, I have this object um, in this system, and I'm going to simulate its evolution in time. And if the object happens to collide with something else, I just want to know what happens. I want to resolve that collision in a physically accurate, or at least a physically plausible way. I would say that collision avoidance is more of a control problem. So we actually want to control the dynamics of our system so that things don't collide. And if things do end up colliding, we actually don't really care that much about simulating the outcome because that's already kind of a failure mode. We've already failed at our objective of preventing collisions. So you know the most probably uh, serious real world example is if you're a self-driving car company and you hit someone with a car, it doesn't really matter how accurately you simulate the damage afterwards because you hit someone with a car. And so I don't want to say that one is better than the other because these are, again, different problems. And both are appropriate in different contexts. Um, as I mentioned, collision detection comes up a lot in physics engines, games, things like that. It's useful in engineering also when you're like designing a bridge and you want to know how it holds up under different situations. Um, collision avoidance, on the other hand, would be more appropriate for something like path planning, as I mentioned, for self-driving vehicles, where you really don't want to crash. Or things like uh, math visualization, where like uh, 
Isotopies are a common thing that people care about in like mathematics and geometry. And these kind of are invariants. So if you have a collision, then that's changing your invariance and you're not studying the same object anymore. Um, and both of these things can come up in animation depending on what it is you're animating. Um, so again, different problems. And we're going to focus on collision avoidance today in the context of these repulsive curves. Um, so that's kind of the reason why we want to do collision avoidance on curves to begin with. So now let's think about how we actually tackle the problem of collision avoidance. Um, so how do we do it? Well, one way is to come up with a potential function, just a number that tells us how well we're doing at avoiding collisions. So let me just walk through how we do that in this next section. Um, so again, we'd like to proactively avoid collisions um, rather than just responding to them when they happen. And so a really natural way to try to do that is to just have different parts of the curve repel each other from a distance. It's like they're magnets. Um, this way, theoretically, if we do it right, then no part uh, should ever be able to get close to another part um, before this repulsive magnetic-like force uh, pushes it away. Um, so to take some inspiration from the real world, we could imagine that every part of this curve has a uniform positive electric charge. We know that positive charges repel positive charges, so any two points on this curve will end up repelling each other. And the closer they are to each other, the stronger the force would be. Um, in the real world, this uh, repulsion is well known, and we have equations that govern the strength of the repulsion. Um, so we have this function called the Coulomb potential that um, what I've written here is up to a constant factor, which I'm omitting. Um, but it looks like this. It basically looks like one over the distance. And this is the potential energy. And then, of course, the actual force that you would experience in the real world is the gradient of this potential. And taking the gradient of this gives you that inverse square law that we've probably experienced before in like e &M class. Um, so the Coulomb potential is a repulsive potential um, because it makes things repel each other. So we're going to call it a repul repulsive. Um, and that sounds a lot like what we want. We want points to repel each other. So what if we try just using this Coulomb potential directly to generate some forces for curve repulsion? Well, the problem is that um, even though this will work for, say, isolated points in space, if you have a connected curve, then um, you have points that are arbitrarily close together on this curve because it's a continuous thing. Um, and so even though this one over R is kind of, you know, it looks like what we want because it would per give you this infinite barrier to self intersections. Um, the problem is on a continuous curve, um, if you, you know, you have to discretize it in some way. And if you refine your curve increasingly, then you get points that are arbitrarily close together, um, and your energy will blow up. Um, you have a one over R, and as that R goes to zero, you're going to approach infinity. And in the limit of refinement, the energy is just going to be infinite all the time, um, which is not very useful numerically. And we would rather have it be infinite only some of the time, you know, when we want it to be, which is to avoid actual collisions and not just points that are actually near each other on the curve. Um, so we want a potential that can kind of differentiate these two cases. We want a potential that approaches infinity when there are like disjoint pieces that are actually in danger of colliding, um, but not when there are just neighboring pairs on the curve that can never move away from each other no matter what you do. Um, so we really want the potential to be able to ignore its neighbors, um, which is also something that I'm sure people who live in noisy apartments would also want. Um, so what's the difference between these situations quantitatively? Well, if you think about it, um, one way to quantify is on the smooth curve, if X and Y are close along this curve, if they're actually intrinsic neighbors, then their displacement is going to be almost entirely tangent to the curve. Um, there's not any separation in the perpendicular direction. So whatever potential we use, this is kind of a clue that we're going to want it to involve tangents or normals or something like that. Um, so I'm going to walk through just a geometric thought experiment here, which will eventually lead to the energy. Um, so first imagine that we just have this point on a curve and we fix a sphere to be tangent to that 
curve at this yellow point. Um, for now, let's just think about 2D. So the sphere is really just going to be a circle. Um, then if we pin that point of the circle to be tangent um, to the curve, then the only degree of freedom we really left have is the radius. We can make the circle bigger or smaller while keeping it tangent and attached to that point. But we can't rotate it about that point because it would violate this tangency condition. And we can't translate it away because obviously it would not be pinned at that point anymore. Um, so we really only have this one degree of freedom in that case, which is the radius. Now, if we have one degree of freedom, we can add one constraint. So we can force the sphere additionally to pass through a second point. So now the sphere is actually uniquely determined. Um, for any set of point, tangent, and second point, there's only one sphere that can be tangent to the first point and passing through the second point. This is similar to just the uh, more well-known geometric fact that any three points in the plane determine a circle. In this case, any point, second point, and tangent determine a circle as well. Um, so yeah, the sphere is now uniquely determined. Um, and if I move this point around, we can kind of see how this sphere uh, changes shape in order to pass through that second sphere. Now we can, uh, or pass through the second point. Now we can move that second point around freely, but we can also think about um, where would that second point would actually lie in general, which is on another curve. So what happens if we move that second point along this other curve? Well, we can see here that um, the radius of the sphere has to shrink as the second point gets closer along the curve. And it does so in a fairly, you know, a fairly smooth way. Um, and this makes sense because these two points are getting closer together. Naturally, something that intersects the two would have to shrink. And indeed, in this case, that's what happens. The thing that is a little bit less obvious is what happens if we move the second point along the same curve. Now, in this case, instead of getting smaller, the radius of the sphere actually gets larger. Intuitively, if we get closer and closer along this uh, smooth you know, differentiable curve, the two points get closer to being separated in only the tangent direction. Um, and if they are exactly separated in only the tangent direction, then the sphere actually needs infinite radius. It needs to be a line to pass through both of these points while still staying tangent. Um, yeah, so the radius of the sphere gets larger and eventually approaches infinity. And so this really gives us kind of that differentiation that I was talking about earlier, where um, the radius of the sphere is a quantity that can uh, behave differently depending on whether the point is approaching along the tangent direction, as um, would be the case if the point lied on the same curve, versus if the point was approaching in the perpendicular direction, as would be the case on a different curve. And so we're going to call this radius of the sphere the tangent point radius. And the sphere itself, by the way, is going to be called the tangent point sphere. Um, so we're almost there. Um, now all we need to do is consider the inverse of that radius, 1 over um, r. And uh, if you just you know, push this inverse through, then you see that for uh, points in different sections that are nearly colliding, the radius approaches zero, which means the uh, inverse radius approaches infinity. Um, and that sounds a lot like the infinite potential barrier that we want to prevent uh, intersections. On the other hand, if the point is approaching along the tangent direction, then the radius itself will approach infinity, which means that the energy um, or you know, the value of this inverse will approach zero. So effectively, contributions from neighbors on the same curve are going to vanish. Um, as you get closer. No, and this is true independently of resolution because it just purely depends on the geometry of the curve. Is it fine to ask question now or do you want to wait? Sure, for go ahead. Uh, so this means that even if the point is on the same curve, if it's like a little bit far away from the point, you will still have some potential yeah, energy. That's there. right. Um, it will still contribute some potential energy from points that are farther away, but not like immediate neighbors of the curve. Um, the important part is that the energy um, goes to zero as you get closer and closer. Um, so you don't get this infinite blow up. Um, okay. So you mean that like the, the, if there's another curve that is close to you, that energy will dominate. So the, yes. the energy from like the other point that are further away doesn't really Yeah, matter. exactly. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, good question.
Um, and yeah, so the, uh, the upshot of all this is that this inverse radius is going to be exactly the repulsive potential that we want to prevent um, self-intersections. Um, so on a curve, um, all we really need is a slick expression for computing this tangent point radius. And um, while I don't have time to go through the actual derivation here, um, the expression exists, um, it's known, and it's actually fairly simple. Um, you just need a couple norms and a cross product. Um, so it's actually fairly cheap to evaluate this kernel, and you don't actually need to worry about computing this tangent sphere exactly. Um, you can just directly get the radius. Um, so then the potential that we're going to use is going to be this inverse tangent point radius. Um, our energy is just going to be this one over R, and we're going to call this energy the tangent point energy. And this was first discovered in the you know, by uh, these guys, Buck and Orloff, um, who are studying it in the context of knot theory, where these kinds of curve energies are quite important because they look for a lot of, um, they're, they're looking for ways to kind of uh, basically detect if curves can be uh, untangled or not. Um, but in our case, we can just use it for general curve repulsion. Um, so that was all in 2D, but it turns out that in 3D, um, all the same stuff essentially works. Um, in 3D, you can find the smallest sphere that is tangent at the first point x and passes through the second point y. And in fact, the exact same expression with the norms and cross products actually works in 3D um, as well as it does in 2D. So in fact, we don't even need to worry about actually finding the sphere. Again, we just evaluate the radius directly using the same expression. Um, and so the tangent point energy is going to be the tool that we used throughout the rest of this talk to uh, do collision avoidance on curves. And I should say that this yellow arrow that I'm kind of visualizing as the uh, point moves around is kind of a rough proxy for what the energy, or rather what the uh, gradient of the energy would look like as you move along. So you can see that indeed the gradient pushes this second curve away um, arbitrarily strongly as it gets closer, but it kind of does not do that much. It certainly does nothing to immediate neighbors of the first point and does very little on uh, points that are farther away, but still on the same curve. Um, so that's the energy. Um, and so now the second half of this is just how are we going to actually optimize this energy? Um, to actually get collision avoidance behavior. Um, you know, in general, we want to find the most self-avoiding configuration possible. And the effect this is going to have, it's going to kind of space out elements as evenly as possible. So it's going to untangle these knots. It's going to smooth out sharp corners. It's going to expand uh, segments of the curve that are very close together. It's going to do stuff like that. And so the natural way to do this is just gradient descent, right? Um, so if you have an energy, you can take its gradient and then you just do gradient descent. Um, and so indeed, if we try gradient descent, uh, just regular gradient descent with line search, um, well, I'm gonna play a video of what it looks like. Um, and the video is actually playing, it's just really slow. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think for this simulation, it ran it for like a thousand steps and like con condensed it into the space of like uh, 60 or played it back at a speed of 60 frames per second. And this is what you see. Um, you can take a crap ton of steps and uh, nothing much happens. And in fact, if I speed this video up by 10x, um, you still can't really see much. But you sh if you watch closely, you can see when the video loops. So you have some evidence that something was changing in the simulation. Um, regular gradient descent on this energy is just incredibly slow. Um, so of course the big question is why Can I interrupt is it? for a sec. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you, you described that the energy is for a pair of points, but mm -hmm. uh, for the discretization of it, are you integrating along pairs of linear edge segments? Uh, yes. Um, for our implementation, we we consider all pairs of edges um, for the energy and then uh, differentiate that with respect to vertices to get the actual motions. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the discretization can vary. You can also, you could also define it purely in terms of vertices if you want it. Um, um, you know, there are a lot of ways to diff, you know, discretize this kind of smooth double integral on the curve, but we chose to do it on edges for the energy value. Um, yeah, good question. Um, so why is it so slow? Um, it's kind of the big question we need to answer. Uh, 
Um, well, derivatives are kind of inherently local. Um, you, we know that um, the, uh, for instance, a derivative is just like the tangent plane at one single point. So it only considers like the immediate arbitrarily small neighborhood of that point. Um, and so gradients are gonna behave the same way. The gradient at any point is going to depend on just the arbitrarily small neighborhood around that point. Um, and this uh, leads to a lot of just jumping around on the uh, value of the gradient because it depends on these high frequency features that are possibly not even perceptible to the eye. So like this curve discretization looks pretty smooth to me, but as it turns out, the actual gradient you get when you evaluate it numerically is uh, not uh, is not very smooth at all. Um, so why is it like this? Well, it's because it's local. Um, and oh, this means sorry, that, but <laughs> um, I mean, the energy would be local if, or, or the gradient would be local if the energy was also like integrated locally. But here you have a, a double integral. The energy at one point depends on the entire curve. So it doesn't feel that local to me anymore. Yeah, I suppose it's, um, it would be more precise to say that the, uh, uh, the dependence of the, like, yes, it uh, depends on, like, you're differentiating terms that involve all points um, along the curve, but the contribution of those points um, is going to kind of fall off rapidly. Um, so in our case, it's more like the uh, gradient is kind of dominated by the immediate uh, neighbors in the sense of being near in space, not like on the curve, because as we discussed, the energy discounts neighbors on the curve. But um, essentially the gradient, um, the contributions of the gradient are dominated by the like pairs of points that are closest. Okay. Um, and the, yeah, so that's one part. And the other part is that um, I guess by local, I also mean that um, for any point, it only tells you like, it, it's, it's kind of like a greedy approach. Like every point wants to move where it would immediately be able to decrease its energy. But um, well, as it turns out, a lot of the times points need to actually make locally like less optimal moves in order to unravel the entire curve. Um, so in, for instance, in this case, what's happening is that the gradient flow is making really rapid progress um, locally in like moving every point away from its immediate like nearby points, but it's really not doing what it ultimately needs to do to reach the lowest energy configuration, which is just to untangle this knot and turn it into like a circle. Um, yeah, so that that's really more what I mean by local. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's a good distinction. The word local is kind of overloaded here. Um, but basically what I mean more so is that every point wants to make the local move that, um, helps itself the most. Um, and because of this, it takes a long time to actually get to the global low frequency motions that you would need, um, in order to actually make more progress on, on tangling knots, for instance. Um, so why, see, yeah, okay, so why, um, I just explain why, but what can we do about um, this sort of uh, concentration of the energy around these like uh, high frequency mo uh, motions that only address sort of local features? Um, well, um, as with a lot of things in geometry, we can use the Laplacian. Um, so if we have the differential DE, we can compute a sort of less local gradient, something that produces more low, uh, uh, lower frequency, more global motions by solving the equation Laplace of G equals D. Um, this looks a lot like a Poisson equation, but it's not quite a Poisson equation as I'll explain. Um, but you know, the, the question is just what does this actually do? Um, the reason it's not a Poisson equation is because the gradient is not the same as you know, like heat sources. Um, geometrically, the gradient can be kind of defined as producing the differential in a uh, direction V. So it gives you the directional derivative in this 
direction. And the way you get that is by taking an inner product with the gradient. Now, classically, um, what you do is you just take the L2 inner product, um, the Euclidean metric. Um, and this gives you the sort of classical steepest ascent notion of the gradient. Um, however, what we can do is use a different metric. And if we do this, then we actually get a different gradient. And this makes sense because the metric is telling you about lengths. And if your lengths are different, then naturally the notion of what direction is steepest is also going to be different. So as an example, what we can do is consider this H1 metric, which is called a Sobolev metric. And the, uh, you know, the, what this metric is, is it's really just taking the dot product between the derivatives of the functions instead of the uh, functions themselves. And this captures some notion of smoothness of the functions, because if the function has a norm under this derivative, then it at least has to be differentiable. Um, and the norm tells you something about how, um, how smooth it is. Um, and so again, this because this metric is really just the dot product of the gradients, um, well, this is essentially the same as just taking the Laplacian um, of one of them. And then if we go back to that uh, notion of the gradient producing a directional derivative in a direction B, um, then if you sub this through, um, what you get is uh, this final equation, um, which if you then get rid of the Vs, um, you get this. You get just Laplace of G equals DE, which is exactly what I mentioned before. So solving this equation actually gives you the gradient under this H1 Sobolev metric. Um, so that's theoretically what's happening. So what does it actually do in practice? Um, what does this in practice? Um, so before we had this gradient that was quite jumpy. Um, and after we solve this equation, we get this gradient kind of smeared out across the entire curve. And um, if you were just kind of mentally time step, you would see that it would produce much larger scale motions. And indeed, if you actually time step, then it does produce much smoother motions. Um, and we see way faster progress. Um, so this one took 14 gradient steps in total compared to the thousand before that did not even really do anything. Um, so this is kind of the gateway to a whole family of Sobolev type gradient descent methods. Um, and these have been used in graphics before in a variety of situations like minimal surfaces, lunar flow, um, deformation energies in this uh, accelerated quadratic proxy paper. Um, and they're just in general, a really powerful tool provided you have the right, um, you're, you're working on a problem where they're applicable. Um, in our case, they're actually not exactly applicable because most Sobolev type uh, algorithms just focus on either the Laplacian um, for, for instance, minimal surfaces or the bi-Laplacian for, for instance, Wilmer flow. In our case, um, neither of these are actually right. Um, and before I explain like theoretically why that is, I'm just gonna show these videos where we see, okay, um, you know, they're doing, you know, the, the H1 one with the Laplacian is doing better than the gradient descent one for sure. Um, the H2 one is, you know, has some other issues. Um, we can see that both in general are, you know, they look like they could have some time or so, they look like they have some room to improve. Like H1 in particular, even though it does do a better job, it still kind of has these uh, segments where it feels like it should be going faster, but instead it's kind of stuttering. I'm sorry, um, what does too global mean? Is there a thing that's just too global? Too global in the sense that it's too low frequency. So um, like, uh, okay. what you really want is to get rid of those sharp corners and, and round them out because eventually the minimizer of this not untangling problem should be a circle. Okay. Um, but if your motion is too high frequency you or too low frequency, you actually cannot contain the motions that would round out those corners because those motions would be concentrated around the corners. Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, yeah, instead of global and local, probably a better, the, the more precise way to phrase it would just be low frequency versus high frequency. Um, so why, so let's go back and think about why these Sobolev methods work so well on these other problems that I discussed. And uh, this is something that has been kind of, I'd say inconsistently considered in the past. Um, but the reason these Sobolev methods work so well for those particular problems is because the order of the metric actually matches the order of the flow in terms of like the differentiability of the flow. 
Um, the, uh, so for instance, like the Dirichlet energy is second order um, and the Laplacian also happens to be a second order operator. Um, these two things match. And so the result is that you get very fast convergence if you were to use the Laplacian to like precondition your gradient descent on Dirichlet energy. Um, likewise, the Wilmore energy is fourth order um, and the bi Laplacian, which is just a Laplacian squared, happens to be fourth order. So those things match and then you get very fast convergence. Um, and so an intuitive explanation of why this is, is um, your gradient descent equation is essentially DDT equals the gradient. And this is actually a, uh, that gradient in general involves spatial derivatives. So your gradient descent equation is actually a partial differential equation. Um, and PDEs are notoriously hard to integrate, especially those with high order spatial derivatives. Um, there are a lot of conditions that limit your time steps. Um, you know, I won't go into that here. But intuitively, if you invert the metric um, by using it as a preconditioner, um, because the metric has the same order as the uh, spatial order of your PDEs, um, adding that inverse metric reduces the order of those spatial derivatives to zero effectively. So you're kind of simplifying your PDE into just an ODE, which has much less stringent time step restrictions and is much easier to integrate. And the end result of that is your gradient descent will converge much faster. Um, so at a high level, that's really why this matching the metric to the differential is important. Um, as it turns out, the, it, the order of the tangent point energies differential is actually not an integer like one or two. It's actually a fractional value. So that means we actually need to use a fractional order metric to match it. And so what we're going to be using is the uh, fractional Laplacian, which similar to the bi Laplacian, just being the Laplacian squared. Um, the fractional Laplacian is just Laplace to the S for some S between, in our case, one and two. And we're going to call this the HS metric, um, analogous to the H1 and H2 metrics. Um, and I should note that our metric is not actually exactly the fractional Laplacian, but it's very close. It's derived from the fractional Laplacian. The details are in the paper. Um, and I won't go through the actual construction of the uh, fractional Laplacian. It is provided in this previous work paper by Klaus Nicky. Um, they actually provide a whole number of definitions of the fractional Laplacian, and we use one of them that happens to be convenient for numerics. Um, the end result is that um, this fractional order uh, metric turns out to be a very happy middle ground that provides very fast convergence for our energy. So much faster than uh, either H1 or H2. Um, and by the way, these videos are actually um, correct. Well, at least when they first played, they were played in real time. So this is reflective of the actual wall clock time it took to reach these configurations on a computer um, and not per time step. Um, so yeah, that's a very nice, uh, it's a very nice framework for optimization. Um, of course, one problem I haven't mentioned is that our energy is an all pairs energy. We need to consider all pairs of vertices as edges. And the, uh, the, uh, the fractional Laplacian is actually also very expensive to evaluate. Um, I won't go into too much detail about how we address this, but there are accelerations that are known um, for addressing these kinds of problems. Um, we have implemented several of them. For the sake of time, I won't, you know, I can't really go through all of these, you know, it's quite involved, but um, you know, Arn's hut is known for like uh, doing these kinds of all pairs simulations originally for n body simulation, but you can adapt it to other things. And then for the actual fractional Laplacian, we have these things called hierarchical matrices, um, in which you combine with multi grid. And the end result is that we get some something like n log n for the runtime. So it's sub quadratic enough that we can actually run it on real examples. Um, so the takeaway of all this is by solving that linear equation with the fractional Laplacian to get a smooth gradient direction, um, we can quickly reach the minima of the tangent point energy. And these kind of re uh, these represent highly self-avoiding configurations. And they kind of generally have the flavor of the figures that I'm showing here. Um, things just want to move away to each other. They spread things out. Um, things become round. And so now let's get to the last part, the fun part, which is uh, what it's all this good for anyway, like what cool stuff can we do with it? Well, I showed you these exam these uh, these animations earlier, which, you know, the headphones untangling is kind of fun. Um, but beyond that, knot untangling is actually really related to uh, 
beyond like graphics, not like these energy based non entangling problems are widely studied in knot theory, um, because where they really want uh, they really want to answer this on knot equivalent or not isotopy problem, which is given two knots, are they equivalent? Can you untangle one and then like potentially retangle it to become this other one? If we were able to show that our method always succeeds at untangling knots, then that would be actually a really major mathematical breakthrough, but um, we unfortunately have had no such luck. Um, but in practice, it performs very well at just untangling knots and reducing them to their lowest energy, simplest configurations. Um, some more practical applications include like computing graph embeddings in 2D and 3D. This is like a common thing in graph or math visualization where you kind of want to draw a, either a planar or a non-planar graph in a readable way. Um, and so if we treat the graph edges as space curve segments and we have constraints that keep them attached to these like graph node points, um, then we can use our repulsive potential to get uniform spacing with these uh, curved edges, which is kind of neat. Um, it's also interesting to think about what kinds of patterns you get if you just enclose a curve inside some fixed domain and then you force it to grow longer and longer. Um, you end up getting these kind of interesting details that are reminiscent of like Hilbert space filling curves. Um, so the top left two are contained inside these bounding volumes. So they have to remain inside the space. Um, that uh, bounding, the boundary of this volume actually exerts a repulsive potential of its own that keeps the uh, curves packed inside. The uh, two in the bottom and right are actually constrained to be exactly on that surface. Uh, in both cases, you get a lot of emergent detail that you'd be kind of hard pressed to get if you try designing, I don't know, like a Brahmin noodle block by hand. Um, lastly, we looked a little bit into how this might be applicable to something like path planning. Um, so the idea here is that each of these balls represents a robot and they all want to get to the opposite corners. And so the current motion plan gets them to the opposite corners, but they also end up colliding with each other in the center because um, these robots are not just points, they have some size and that size is not accounted for in this initial uh, motion trajectory. So we can model these trajectories as 3D curves where the up axis represents time. Um, and then we can just optimize these curves using our framework. And if we do that, um, you end up getting this new set of motion trajectories where because the uh, curves are now separated in space time, um, when you actually play it back by kind of just sampling the positions along the y axis, um, the robots themselves also remain separated just in space. Uh, so this is really kind of an algorithm for social distancing, which I'm sure we've all had enough of, but now we can do it computationally. And so what, you know, what's next? Uh, well, the natural thing is to generalize the tangent point energy to surfaces. And most of the same theory still works. It's just a matter of uh, adapting the discretization to surfaces and then trying to make it a lot faster. Um, so these are all like kind of some preliminary uh, you know, test runs of these tangent point energy on a surface. And you see, you get the same kind of, I guess you could call it untangling behavior where it just kind of tries to uh, simplify the surface into its like the, the most basic embedding it could have without actually changing its isotopy class or anything. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we have a lot more work on optimization of the algorithm um, in terms of making it faster to really get it to support higher resolutions. And then, you know, in the future, we might have some applications that mix um, curves and surfaces in the kind of like, I don't know, multi-physics type of thing. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that wraps up my talk on repulsive curves. Uh, thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions, if there are. Thanks for the talk and the uh, Robin bunny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, this will start off. Um, I see you, you mentioned the that you need a, a fractional sublet metric, but mm -hmm. how do you determine the order of your energy even? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the uh, 
what you have to think about is, um, this gets into a little bit of functional analysis. What you have to think about is dual spaces. Um, you can think of the gradient as a map from, uh, it's, it's a map, the gradient going back to this definition of like it producing a directional derivative in some direction, um, you can think of it as a map from like your space, um, uh, your space of functions that it accepts um, into real numbers because it takes a direction that lies in, you know, it takes a direction on your surface, which is really like a function, say like a real number per vertex or a vector per vertex, and it maps that to a real number. So what that means is that this gradient is actually kind of a member of the dual space um, of your initial like functionals. And uh, if you uh, analyze it as a uh, member of the dual space, you can determine, I'm trying to reproduce the derivation in my head right now. But essentially if you can figure out like because the uh because these all reside in like Sobolev spaces which are denoted like h s for like some power s and this s actually represents the uh like the differentiability of the functions that reside in that Sobolev space um well differentiability is exactly the the uh quantity that determines the order of a uh given like uh of a, of a given uh function or mathematical object. Um, so you, you can figure out like what this S exactly is and that S is the, uh, you can figure out what S it is for the gradient just based on some like fancy functional analysis and that S tells you the, uh, the order of the uh, energy and there's something, there, there's some fact about Solev's, the, the dual spaces of Sobolev spaces that uh, completes the derivation. I mean, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's in the paper, in the appendix. It's uh, challenging to explain. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't give a better explanation just off the top of my head, but like yeah, essentially there's, yeah, you can do functional analysis to analyze, you know, you go through this uh, process and you get the, uh, in the end, there's actually just a really simple uh, formula for the order. It's something like, uh, it, it's something like like p minus one over two, um, where p is like the power that you raise the tangent point energy to. It's, it, it ends up being very simple, but the derivation is quite complex. There were, it looks like there were two powers, like one in the numerator. Yeah, and one so, in in the, the, yeah so one thing I didn't present in this talk is that um, in, in the most general case, you don't have to uh, have just the tangent point energy. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me dig that up. Yeah, so in the most general case, you can put, like, you can raise the numerator to an alpha, and you can raise the denominator to a beta. And this gives you some more fine-grained control over just what strength of repulsion you have in your system. Um, in general, the higher you make these exponents, uh, or rather the higher you make the denominator exponent, the uh, stronger the repulsion will be. And the higher you make the numerator exponent, the more sort of uh, aggressively it cancels out uh, neighboring contributions. In general, we just raise the two of them in tandem. So we keep like the denominator exponent to be twice the numerator. Um, but yeah, then, then there's a formula that depends on those two exponents, um, which you can use to compute the actual order of that energy. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so you make this distinction between collision detection and like the, the problem you're solving in yes. the beginning, but do you think like a similar method to yours can be useful for collision detection as well, like for yarn simulation or hair simulation or things like that? Um, it's, it's certainly something like, I would say it, um, could be used in conjunction with like traditional sort of continuous collision detections. Um, this is actually quite a powerful combination because, um, the, uh, the sort of shortcoming for using like just standard, like CCD on like textiles, for instance, is that once two things start colliding, they're kind of just stuck there because whatever motion was pushing them into each other has probably not gone away in just the span of a time step. 
and your collision detection does nothing to actually pop them away from each other. Um, so using these in conjunction would actually be, uh, uh, you, would, you would be able to guarantee to prevent collisions from occurring, um, which if you, uh, if you only use this uh, repulsive curves energy, it's sort of like a best effort thing, but it is theoretically possible for things to collide if you get like really unlucky. Um, even though this rarely happens in practice. But if you combine the two, then yeah, you'll never collide. And when your collision, uh, collision detection prevents something from passing through each other, you actually have some way of popping them apart again. Yeah, one, one thing I was thinking was that the local minimum is actually, a, like you said, is a big problem of those like traditional methods. Yeah, so. this is a thing that, yeah, a lot of things uh, like, uh, I was talking with these guys. Uh, I was talking with like Jesse from Nervous System about like some of the stuff that he's been doing with like uh, differential growth, and uh, kind of what he said in practice. What happens is that like once two things start colliding, kind of the entire dynamics just becomes governed by collision detection. Um, and so yeah, having this in conjunction with that could potentially help you to uh, get back to a state where again like the differential growth is again cool. determining the shape instead of just like, okay, crap, I need to arrange this somehow so it doesn't clip through each other, you know, like so. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good idea. Uh, another question, um, like often when we do these shape optimization type things, there's also constraints like, that yes. I don't know your curve lie on the surface of some manifold, for example. Yes. Um, and let's just say the energy is like super simple; it's the Dirichlet energy. Does the order change with the constraint space? No. So in general, the constraints should not affect the order because the constraint manifold is essentially a um, it's a subspace of the like the unconstrained phase space that you would otherwise have. Um, and so if it has a certain differential order in the unconstrained phase space, um, certainly the order would not increase, which is the important part. And I intuitively, I don't wanna, I, I wanna say it wouldn't, it would just be the same. Um, though admittedly, I am not completely 100% sure, but I, my hunch is that the, uh, because your constraint manifold is a submanifold within your original phase space, the order on that submanifold should not really change. Unless you have something really weird where, okay, if, if I, have, I have like a constraint space where, okay, now all of the, uh, you know, now, now my uh, energy is totally constant along this constraint space or something like that. Well, I think you could write almost any energy as a linear function plus very nonlinear constraints. I like, like take an arbitrary polynomial, uh, like x plus x squared plus x cubed, mm -hmm. replace x squared with the variable y, replace x cubed with z and add the constraint that z equals x squared, or wait, y equals x squared, z equals x cubed, and now the energy is just x plus y plus z and it's first order. But all the nonlinears are, are pushed into the constraints. Yeah, so, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. I have to think about that more. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I guess maybe I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for you on that um, right now. Yeah, that's, that's okay. I know it's not like like you're working in, in free 3D space, so it wouldn't come up for for this. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, though. Uh, think about it some more. I uh, one more question about the, the earbuds video. Um, that one has a non-manifold point. Yes. So there, 
the energy should blow up. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, so what we do is a little bit cheesy, but we just kind of exclude the uh, one ring of the non-manifold juncture. Um, yeah, in general, the uh, the yeah, I mean, in general, the uh, you know, as long as you get a finite value out of the energy, you're you're good. Um, like this blow up, this this blow up is really an issue, like in the limit of refinement, um, which is why theoretically you want to get a, like address it for the energy. But it's true that um, the uh, if you were to just refine this um, endlessly, then you would uh, you would get some kind of blow up. So you would need to do something. A little bit special about that, like we and we do have ways to uh, address that as well that are possible within our framework. Um, so, for instance, you can uh, rather than modeling a juncture point as just a single point, you can model it as like a sphere, where the uh, um, the adjacent edges to that sphere are like fixed to be on the surface, and then uh, even no matter how much you uh, no matter how much you refine the curves that are attached, the sphere remains constant radius and uh, you don't get blow up. So there are theoretical ways that you can like make this right in practice, but, um, or you, that you can make it right like formally, but uh, in practice, we, uh, yeah, we just, we just kind of exclude the neighbors of the non-manifold point just to uh, get the one, uh, um, just to, just to get a value for the energy there. I see. Got it. Yeah, I mean the other, you know, the other issue is that um, at the non-manifold juncture, there's no unique tangent direction, so you can't, strictly speaking, evaluate the energy there either. Um, so everything just gets a lot simpler if you just don't evaluate the energy at these junctures. I see. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> As if, uh, if no one else's questions, I'll keep going. <laughs> um, hey, you showed this diagram of the gradient of the tangent point energy like mm -hmm. pretty early on, and it looked like that gradient wasn't normal to the curve. Um, um, this one. Uh, further before. Um, oh, I guess here they are normal to the curve. Uh, like these? Yeah, this one. Yeah, this is not actually, uh, let me go to the one with the arrows. Uh, this is not actually the gradient of the tangent point energy. It, um, it's like a proxy for it. Um, it just points directly away from the um, other point. Um, OK, I see. The other, the, other, the other thing about that, though, is um, uh, this is only one pair of points. Um, so if you were to integrate around the entire curve, then like, uh, if you were to integrate the entire energy, the actual energy around the entire curve, then the result would be normal. But if you just consider a single pair of points, um, it's not necessarily the case that it's, um, normal because it would just point away from the two points. Okay, got it. All right. Well, uh, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.